class, we're going to discuss the Lewis structures of commonly confused polyatomic ions, fulminate and cyanate. Fulminate uh, is often represented as CNO minus or ONC minus, whereas cyanate is represented as OCN minus or NCO minus. Uh, one way of remembering it is that the fulminate ion will have the nitrogen in the middle, whereas the cyanate ion will have the carbon atom in the middle. Uh, fulminated mercury was in common use as a detonator due to its susceptibility to shock, heat, or friction, and has since been replaced by less toxic substances like tetrazine. So mercury 2 fulminate, also known as mercuric fulminate, would have this structure, mercury atom in the middle and the two fulminate uh, molecules on either side, and I just realized I forgot one of my uh, formal charges. Uh, to draw the Lewis structure of fulminate, we begin by doing an accounting of how many electrons there are in the molecule. There's a carbon atom, nitrogen atom, an oxygen atom, and an electron, an extra electron for the minus charge. So carbon likes to have four valence electrons, nitrogen likes to have five, oxygen likes to have six valence electrons, and the extra one electron for the minus charge gives you 16 electrons that have to be accounted for. So we draw the atom with the nitrogen atom in the middle and a single bond to each one of the other atoms. And then that uses up four electrons, so we have to account for 12 more. And what we do is we put six on either one of the two atoms that are on the other side. Now let's do an accounting of the octets. Each atom likes to have eight electrons in its vicinity. Carbon has two, four, six, eight. So that's, it, its octet is fulfilled. Nitrogen only has four in this configuration, so its octet is not fulfilled. That's why I put a little X here. And for oxygen, two, four, six, eight, it has a completed octet. If we were to look uh, for formal charges, we can count them up. We recall that lone pairs count for two, bonding pairs count for one when it comes to charge consideration uh, considerations. And also keep in mind that what the atoms like to possess for charge in a Lewis structure is given by its position in the periodic table. So if it's in group 16, like uh, oxygen, it likes to have six valence electrons. If it's in group 15, like nitrogen, it likes to have five valence electrons in its possession, and carbon likes to have four. So for carbon, we're gonna see that it has two, four, six, plus one more for the uh, bonding pair, a total of seven electrons in its possession, but it only wants to possess four, so it's gonna have a negative three charge with this, uh, in this drawing. And nitrogen would have two electrons in its possession, but it wants to possess five, so it, it would have a positive three charge. Oxygen would have a minus one charge, given by the fact that it has two, four, six, plus one, seven electrons in its possession, although it wants to have six. So this molecule is full of formal charges, and the way we can remedy that partly is by taking these two lone pairs and turning them into bonding pairs. When we redraw the molecule that way, all the atoms now have an octet, but uh, for charge, you'll see that the carbon atom, which wants to have four electrons, actually possesses one, two, three, plus the two here, is five, so it would have a negative charge of one as a formal charge. Uh, nitrogen, which wants to possess five electrons because it's a group 15 element, actually possesses one, two, three, four, and therefore it has a plus one charge, and oxygen would have a minus one charge still because it hasn't changed anything from the last structure. So. Uh, overall, the, with the molecule drawn this way, you'd have a formal charge of negative one on the carbon, a formal charge of plus one on the nitrogen, and a formal charge of minus one on the oxygen. The molecule has to have an overall charge of minus one. So this is the best Lewis structure we can draw for fulminate, and it gives you an understanding of why it's an explosive substance. It's basically playing hot potato with the few electrons that it has. Uh, and it has a highly electronegative oxygen atom, a highly electronegative nitrogen atom, so that helps stabilize it to some extent, but not completely. So there, there are formal charges that have to be dissipated in this molecule. Uh, here's another alternate uh, structure that I tried to draw to make a better Lewis structure, and I ended up having a negative two formal charge on carbon, so this is not a likely uh, good structure. On the next board, we look at the structure of cyanate. Cyanate has the same atoms in it, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. Now the carbon atom is the central atom, and the nitrogen and oxygen are on, on either side. It's got the same number of 
valence electrons. Again, nitrogen is five, carbon four, oxygen six, plus one for the negative one charge. A total of 16 electrons have to be accounted for in the structure. So we draw the preliminary structure with carbon in the middle, nitrogen and oxygen on either side, and then we have to dissipate an additional 12 electrons. So I put six on each one of the satellite atoms. And when I calculate the formal charges, nitrogen, which wants to possess five electrons, actually has two, four, six, plus one, seven. So it has a surplus of two electrons. That's why it's got a negative two charge, a formal charge. Carbon, which in addition to not having a completed octet, only has possession of two electrons in this structure when it wants to have four. So it's going to have a plus two formal charge. Oxygen, again, has a minus one under these conditions. Oxygen wants to possess six electrons. It actually has seven if you count this, this bonding pair as the one. So two, four, six plus one, seven wants six, so it has an extra of one. If we uh, rewrite the Lewis structure by placing these two bonding, these two lone pairs as bonding pairs, now we have triple bonded carbon and nitrogen with a lone pair on nitrogen. All the octet requirements are met. We see that nitrogen has two, four, six, eight. Carbon has two, four, six, eight. And oxygen has two, four, six, eight. So all the octet requirements are met. There is no formal charge on nitrogen because it wants possession of five electrons and it has one, two, three, plus two, five. Carbon wants four and it has one, two, three, four. And oxygen uh, would like six, but it has seven. But in fact, the cyanate anion has to have a minus one charge. And the most logical place to put that negative charge would be on the oxygen atom because it has the highest electronegativity. And in fact, that's what, what is observed in nature. That is what the cyanate anion, uh, that's the best representation of the cyanate anion. And it's a, it's a stable structure and it's not explosive. So, so if you were to uh, hammer cyanate, uh, a cyanate salt, it wouldn't explode. On the other hand, if you hammer a salt of, of, of a fulminate, like mercury fulminate or silver fulminate, it explodes when you hit it. On the next board, we are just reviewing the uh, evidences of a reaction. And this is grade 10 content, but it, it's it's a good idea to review it. How do you know that a reaction has occurred? Well, there, there are four things you normally will observe. One is that you've got a precipitate. If you mix two solutions and you get a precipitate, it means there's a reaction. If a gas forms, then you've had a reaction. And depending on what you can do with the gas, you could, you, there are tests that you can make to tell you what gas you're dealing with. If you get hydrogen gas, a flaming split will pop. If you have CO2 as the evolving gas, the flaming split will go out when you dip it into the CO2. And if you have oxygen, the, the split will burn more brightly. Uh, evolution of heat or sudden cooling is also an example of a chemical reaction taking place. If the reaction generates heat, it's exothermic. On the other hand, when you mix two things together and they suddenly get colder, it's an endothermic reaction. We're going to learn a little bit more about that when we do the uh, chapter on thermodynamics. And finally, a change of color as occurs with uh, indicator solutions is also indicative of a reaction taking place. Uh, and yesterday I mentioned a single displacement reaction and as a sample of that, I, I showed you what happens when you mix, um, when you mix iron in the form of steel wool into a solution of copper sulfate. So I had a sample of copper sulfate, I put some steel wool into it, I mixed it in, the result was a dark black solution, which upon filtering produced, uh, well this one has a residual of uh, some copper sulfate, this solution has now ferric or ferrous sulfate in there, I'm not sure if it's ferric or ferrous in this case, but there's an iron uh, ion in there, it's a different color than the copper sulfate as you can see. And then what happened to the copper is it precipitated because it's lower on the activity series. So this was the copper sulfate that was the copper that was in the copper sulfate solution turned into metallic copper, and the iron that was in the uh, steel wool turned into the iron ions that we see here in the form of a green solution. So the iron displaced the copper because it is higher up on the activity series than copper. In a double dip displacement reaction, the way we can tell that there's been a reaction is that you get a precipitate. Uh, the typical one that we can think of, uh, and it is sometimes used by not very honest uh, water filter salesmen, will tell you that they're going to mix a clear solution of 
silver nitrate, they don't tell you it's silver nitrate, that just makes you a special disclosing solution that tells you if there's any contaminants in your water. And if there's any chloride, uh, chloride in your water, which you would find normally, uh, then you will get a precipitate of silver chloride. So silver chloride precipitate is gray, and even a very small amount of chloride will produce a visible amount of precipitate. And then you get potassium nitrate as well, which stays in solution, it remains aqueous. It's not, it's not uh, insoluble. On the other hand, the AgCl is insoluble. That's why it forms a solid. And that's how you can tell you've had a reaction in a double displacement reaction, because the two aqueous reagents, which are clear when you mix them, all of a sudden produce some uh, a white precipitate. On the other hand, if you were to mix potassium nitrate and sodium chloride, nothing would happen. You would get a clear solution and that, uh, with no precipitate. That would mean that there's no reaction. And why does that happen in some cases? Why in some cases do you get a reaction and in some other cases you don't get a reaction? Uh, well, the, re the answer to that is that the ions that would normally form a precipitate are attracted to each other, but not as much as they are attracted to the water. So when that happens, they stay, they stay associated with the water, and there's no reaction. Both are soluble in water, these two products. In this reaction, in this, in this non-reaction, uh, both of these salts are soluble in water, which means they are more attracted to the water molecules than to each other. And that means it's not, they're not going to form a crystal. Uh, the last two, three things I want to mention are uh, decomposition reactions. In a decomposition reaction, what you get is, uh, in the abstract form, A, B turning to A plus B. So I, I put three, uh, this is three examples here. If you have potassium chlorate and you heat it, it decomposes into potassium chloride and oxygen. Potassium chlorate used to be used as a um, rocket propellant. It could also be used in, in uh, bullets to help burn the powder mixture faster. I don't know if it's still used. It's probably pretty corrosive, so they're probably, using, they're probably using something else now. Uh, nitrogen triiodide is another substance that detonates when you when you hit it or, or rub it, and it, can, it forms nitrogen gas and iodine crystals. But the energy of the reaction causes the iodine to be the basis for it. Another famous substance that undergoes violent decomposition is dynamite. Dynamite will produce a bunch of different gases like carbon dioxide, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon monoxide. I guess it might even produce cyanide gas uh, in small amounts, depending on how the atoms decide to recombine. I didn't even attempt to balance this equation because depending on the conditions of the explosion, you might get different proportions of gases forming. The other type of reaction we need to be aware of is a synthesis reaction where two or more compounds combine to form one. So A plus B forming AB. An example of that would be when you have ammonia gas combining with hydrochloride gas to form ammonium chloride. It's a classic demonstration where they show, say, uh, a, a beaker full of ammonia gas and a, a, a Q-tip imbued with hydrochloric acid. You bring it close to the ammonia gas, you'll see a white smoke forming. That white smoke is the ammonium chloride. Finally, you have combustion. Combustion is, uh, I guess it's a special form of uh, a, a synthesis reaction because you're combining a hydrocarbon with oxygen and then you're producing two substances, carbon dioxide and water. And uh, our, our society has a lot of combustion reactions in the form of uh, power generation and internal combustion vehicles. And I give you a classic example of a combustion reaction. Octane is being burned in the presence of oxygen to give you carbon dioxide and water. You'll notice that when you balance the equations, the amount of atoms on the left side have to equal the amount of atoms on the right side. So if you have eight carbon atoms in the hydrocarbon here on the left, there have to be eight carbon atoms in the form of carbon dioxide on the right. And if there's 18 hydrogen atoms on the left in the form of the hydrogens on the hydrocarbon of octane, then there have to be 18 hydrogen in the form of water on the right-hand side. And then the oxygen is, there's 12 and a half oxygens on the left. And I, rep I represented that as 25 over 2. Okay, stop there.